headed down to the Mount Marine Laboratory in the Lower Keys to see what the scientists there are doing with the ocean acidity and the coral reef restoration. Come along. So our original lab was um, built on Pigeon Key, which is the end of Seven Mile mm -hmm. um, in 98. And then um, George, a different hurricane, shut down that bridge. So that's what landed us from here mm -hmm. on this property from the crazy monkey researchers. <laughs> Um, and Moat has actually been in the Four Keys involved with coral restoration and mangrove research for about 30 years now. Um, Dr. Eugenie Clark is our like, main founder. She started up in 1955 in mainland Florida out of a one bedroom <laughs> laboratory. And now we have um, a main laboratory and aquarium in Sarasota. We have this location here in Summerland, and we have just recently opened another nursery in Isla Verada and Key Largo Coral Nurseries. So we have expanded quite a bit in the past couple of years. Um, we have over 20 different restoration sites where we outplant our coral, and we have three offshore nurseries now. And we are technically the largest land-based coral nursery in the North America. So, why are we here though? Why is coral important? Why is coral restoration important? So, coral are facing a few different uh, challenges in the wild and it's having a negative effect on our populations and our coral reefs, which is leading to a variety of different problems like climate change, disease, ocean acidification, and just overall habitat loss and biodiversity loss on our reefs. So, we have a couple different programs here on site besides restoration. So we have a coral health and disease program and an ocean acidification program. Yeah, this is the ocean acidification lab. Um, so what we do in here, we do a lot of water quality, kind of what I'm running today. We have a couple instruments in the lab. And what these do is they help us get a full permanent chemistry parameters of any water sample that we decide to collect. <laughs> So this is kind of important, not only just for monitoring our chaos system downstairs, but whenever we have a visiting scientist here on site, and they would like end of century or mid century ocean acidification conditions, we have to provide them back with data of that what we say it is. It is. Um, so right now we're about to have a visiting scientist um, on site actually in next week, and he's studying stone crab larvae, and he wants mid century ocean acidification, which is about seven point eight ish, seven point seven. And then it, end of century, which we're actually predicting is it's going to be more like 7.6 and 7.5. Um, right now, our oceans are sitting about 8.12. However, with the increase of anthropogenic CO2 into the ocean, or into the air, our oceans are becoming carbon sink, kind of like the rainforest of the ocean. It's absorbing all that CO2. Whenever that CO2 mixes with H2O, it forms this carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is a weak acid, so it's readily available, and it disperses into the water, releasing hydrogens. Hydrogens then increase the pH, or decrease the pH, increase the pCO2, causing this ocean acidification phenomenon that we're seeing. Um, ocean acidification is kind of one of three that we deal with here on site. We also have disease, and we have ocean warming. So we're kind of the, um, where she's restoration, we are kind of more of the negative people. Um, but what, what in long jeopardy is what we're trying to do is we're trying to find the most resilient, the most resistant genotype of coral. That way, our restoration efforts then can know, or our, our reproduction efforts will know. So this is our coral health and disease laboratory. Hi, how are you? So our yeah, our coral health and disease program has two locations. I'm the main researcher down here. We're also based in Sarasota. We do research on coral genetic diversity and resilience. So how our corals respond to different stressors on the reef, things like. Um, ocean warming causing bleaching, uh, disease is another huge focus of ours. So we we both uh, we conduct experiments in our uh, experimental system out back that you guys might walk around to. It's, it's a temperature controlled and pH controlled system where we can dose corals with these higher temperatures and see which genetic variants of our corals might respond better to these stressors. So Summer's probably shown you that we have lots of different genetic variants of each species. So those are the little numbers that you're going to see on the bottom of each plug. So okay. we track the genetic identity of every coral individual that we have on site because we know certain things about how those individuals perform. So we can look at their performance in response to heat stress or maybe disease, and we can also look at their genetics and compare them to see how closely related they are, to see which ones might breed well together, which ones are likely to inbreed if we put them next to each other. 
Um, and we ultimately are, have a goal of restoring the most diverse reef possible. So I also lead our genetic management plan, which is really a set of guidelines for other restoration practitioners to follow based on the data we're getting from the genetic diversity and trying to integrate that data into action. And one of those diseases that they were mentioning is called stony coral tissue loss disease. Mm -hmm. So it's very prominent here and it essentially wipes out a lot of our corals. And it reduces the coral coverage from a naturally healthy reef, which is about 25%, like from like 1% to 2%. Ooh. So it reduces our reefs to a functionally extinct reef mm -hmm. because with that limited amount. So they can't reproduce naturally. So that makes it even more important why Grace is looking at the genetic management of everything. Because if we take corals that already are too separated to reproduce naturally, and then we are doing all the supplement and all this uh, restoration, and we outplant stuff that is not genetically able to reproduce correctly, then that kind of forfeits all of our efforts. <laughs> so there's two main ways that we are doing restoration here on site. So one of them, or not really restoration, but reproducing corals on site. One of them is sexual reproduction, which is when corals spawn yearly, and they release gametes and eggs and sperm into the water column, and they meet into the water column and form a um, juvenile coral in which they will swim and so on to the reef. Um, so this is the Coral Reproduction Laboratory. Um, this is the work of Dr. Hannah Cook and Celia Leto. Um, these two large tanks right here are actually our ESS systems, which we can manipulate spawning uh, coral colonies to spawn during any time that we want. So coral naturally spawn the beginning of August and start in June and July in coordination with several different cues that they get via water temperature, current movement, and especially the phases of the moon. So um, in coordination with those things, they'll just release their gametes and eggs um, from their tissue. And they kind of look like little bundles. Um, so you'll see over here, we use ceramic plugs. These are all um, baby d lab that have been settled in the past year and a half. Um, so these are all baby plugs and we will sprinkle that CCA and pixie dust onto the plug so they recognize that chemical cue. Hey, I need to go onto the plug rather than on the side of the raceway or the bottom of a rack or anything like that. And then Celia will monitor these corals through their final life stages until they finally form their first polyp in their mouths and everything like that, and which we observe with this microscope under UV light. So that's actually what this looks like. That's a very, very baby, tiny, tiny coral. Um, and you can see the recruits. And then after the sexual recruits have been uh, grown out into a full size plug, so once it covers the whole plug about the size of a silver dollar, they actually come into my pipeline in restoration. So now we have ocean acidification, coral health and disease, which is telling us, okay, these are the genotypes that you should probably be focusing with. We've got sexual reproduction that's like, okay, we can manipulate these genotypes to make even more crosses. So we can take a mother that's disease resistant and a father that's heat resistant to acclimate to predicted ocean acidification, predict, um, future ocean acidification. And these NCAV are anywhere from 10 to 25 years old, and that's only because our, of our rapid um, growth rate that we use for asexual reproduction. Naturally, for those corals to get that size, it would take anywhere from, 20, uh, from 75 to 100 years. Oh so God. we are shaving down that timeline quite a bit of our interference. So a coral becomes sexually reproductive at size and not age. It doesn't matter. Um, if they reach that size at five years, awesome, they can start reproducing. If they reach that size at 25 years, they can start reproducing. It's all based on size. So that's why we have plant Right. Just leading a tour around. This is our coral restoration um, intern, Cameron. He's actually performing asexual reproduction via our band saws right now. So this is a prime example of what it looks like um, for us in the coral restoration pipeline, as I like to say. So Celia gives a 
sexual um, recruits that become full size, about the size of this whole clock right here. And it looks like this. When she gives it to us, it covers the entire thing. And we take those one or two uh, genetically unique corals and we can turn them into a couple of thousand. Um, so we cut the corals using a bandsaw into small pieces, kind of like uh, around the size of a Lego, one square centimeter. This is a prime example of a newly fragged raceway. So um, in this raceway, we will take them and glue them on the ceramic plugs with the appropriate genetic uh, representation and label for each one. And we put them in our raceways. Up, and we keep them up here. This is kind of what we call our spa or our nursery. Uh, we keep all of our brand new fragged corals up here for about a week before moving them downstairs. Just to let them heal over and get acclimated before I move them out into the sun. Um, and this grow out process from a full size plug to newly fragged to back to a full size plug takes only about two months. Um, so we are producing these corals at a very rapid rate. Um, we frag about a thousand corals a week and we outplant about 3,000 a month. Um, and again, we use that um, asexual reproduction for with fragging because it allows the coral to heal and grow at a faster rate. So imagine that you cut your arm and that tissue grows together much rapidly, much more rapidly than normal if you just like, sever something off. So that's what's happening here. It's the same thing. It actually boosts the growth rate of the coral. We actually discovered microfragmentation on an accident. Um, one of our former staff scientists here, he was carrying one of those large staghorn colonies that I pointed out to you guys, and he actually slipped and dropped it. And he didn't mean to, and there's pieces of staghorn all over the floor, and he panicked, and he's like, oh no. So he threw them into a raceway, and he said, I'll come back to this. We'll see, uh, I'll just come back to this later. And as normal for scientists, we get sucked into various other projects and various other duties of our day. And it took about one to two weeks for him to actually come back to us. And he noticed that with the tissue, it had fully regrown and had started branching out new branches already. So he observed that and said, hmm, I wonder. And now here we are with cracking. This is actually our crab nursery. So why is it important? have corals and crabs. Well, like I mentioned to you guys, our uh, reefs are now very soft coral dominated and macro algae dominated. What loves to eat algae? Crabs. So right now they're at a, a smaller stage. The one I just put in, this is a female. Um, you can tell that her apron goes all the way across. Um, that's how you tell females. Uh, this oh, okay. is a male right here. Um, and theirs does not go all the way across the carapace. It just kind of looks more like a pipe tower, I guess you can call it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that's how you can tell the difference. Once they start to get bigger, their claws get a lot thicker. Um, just for males, not the females. So. The restoration program, this is our domain, our kingdom, as I like to jokingly say. So, like we learned about uh, upstairs with asexual reproduction and sexual reproduction, Celia gives us her sexual recruits. We turn them into a pipeline, and then the pipeline starts from here. So, um, this is what we like to call our display tank. This has um, a collection of the over 17 different species that we work here on site. However, right now we're primarily working with five, just because they are deemed critically endangered. Um, these two raceways are actually our education raceways, so one of the uh, ways that we have a lot of outreach and Involvement in the community is through education programs. So um, they go out and do like kayaking trips and field trips. And these two raceways are holding Cassiopeia, um, which are upside down jellyfish. Cool. Yeah, and you can find them in like the shallow parts of um, the waterways. So if you actually go out and to the right, it's very, very shallow throughout there. It's a lot of seagrass beds and mangroves, and that's where they naturally occur. So this is a prime example of what that outplanting cluster looks like that I mentioned to you guys upstairs. Mm -hmm. So this is with a massive, um, massive species. So we do what is called reskinning a lot of times. We will find an environment or a location 
that was previously dominated by corals, and we will use old colony skeletons to place new tissue on, so that new tissue can use that as a base, and it grows really rapidly. Um, again, these are from previous experiments, um, and we yet like to use these for education purposes to kind of give you guys an idea of what we're doing. So again, um, we call this the pepperoni model. Um, <laughs> where we will plant, I'll plant massive species in varying uh, different arrays to fuse and grow together. And to do this, we actually use a two-part epoxy underwater and we mix it and stick it onto the reef, which is very, very cool. Um, and we have a goal of 80,000 coral um, this year. Uh, we, however, just outlanded our 200,000 coral on the reef which is very interesting and very exciting. Um, and I get a lot of questions of like, is this working? Is this, you know, is this mm -hmm. worth it to do? So there's been uh, several publications about our work here that it is working, yes. And um, we actually, in 2020, recorded 15 different colonies of various species. First time ever recorded of lab-grown corals spawning in the wild. So it is working, it's very exciting. Now that was just a short summary of what you'll actually see if you choose to take the tour. It's very informative and goes deep into all the science involved in all these processes. You can take the tour every Tuesday. You'll register in advance online and it is a free tour, but they do accept donations.